Millions of years ago, the ancestor of sea stars and the other echinoderms thought, I want to be a circle. The problem was, it wasn't a circle, and even today, its descendants most often start their lives out as two-sided bilateral babies. But evolution can do magical things if you have enough time to spare, and as these larvae grow, a second baby, a round baby, starts to grow inside them. The second baby kind of eats the original baby and then bursts out into the world. That's one way to do it. This new body plan of echinoderms has radial symmetry and is a marvel of engineering. First off, the skeletons of echinoderms are made out of these things. <laughs> it looks like a bag of evidence from when they finally arrest the tooth fairy. These pieces are called ossicles, and they're made by cells that are almost like little 3D printers. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and often look like something you might find on a tray at Satan's dentist. Up close, you can see that these ossicles are made out of a porous honeycomb mesh of magnesium calcite. All those little holes allow tissue to grow inside them and to connect them to other ossicles in a kind of 3D jigsaw puzzle. It's a little like Evolution got a model airplane kit, but where the pieces weren't labeled, so there was nothing left to do but get creative. The resulting skeletons can be quite flexible, like those in the arms of the Brittle Star, for example. Or, when they're fused together, they can form the solid dome or test of a sea urchin. But these parts aren't just internal. You can see them on the surface of the sea star as well, in the form of spines or these little crazy things called pedicillary. They might not look like much, but you'll see. In the sea star, the skeleton forms a body cavity, as you can see with this one who's had a bit of a rough day. This cavity is filled with organs and what is essentially seawater. But listen, this isn't just some star-shaped water balloon. Hidden in there is one of the most advanced hydraulic systems found in nature. Look here, on the top of sea stars you'll find a little nipply thing. It looks like where you'd put the pin in to blow up a ball of sport. This is called the madreporite. The madreporite is essentially a valve that leads to a series of canals. The canals are connected to rows of these little tube-like nubbins. The top parts sit inside of the sea star and the bottom parts stick out. Here you can see where the little canal runs down the length of the arm, and these here are the little sticky out bits. Two groups of muscles control the flow of water within these little tubes. One group pushes water down and elongates them, the other shortens them by pushing water back up to the top. These tubed feet, as they're called, run down the length of each arm in a groove. These grooves are often protected by spines, and sometimes they can even close up. <laughs> it's like a dream that a dentist would bring to therapy. In sea stars, one of the functions of these tubed feet is walking. Sometimes the tips of the feet are pointy. This style of tip is especially good for digging around and burying yourself in the sand. Look at this one, he's doing it all fancy. In other species, these tubed feet end in these sort of disc shapes. Looks a bit like an elephant that tried to snort a frisbee. These discs can secrete a kind of a glue, as well as an anti-glue. This allows the sea star to navigate rough terrain or to hold on in a strong current. Science hippies believe that these feet operate more or less independently, following a set of simple rules. Hold on until you're stretched too far and then let go, then swing forward and reattach. These simple rules can lead to two styles of walking. In crawling, the tube feet are all kind of doing their own thing. It's slow, but it gets the job done. But they also have a get me the heck out of here sort of walk. In the right conditions, clusters of feet start moving at the same time and it creates a faster bouncing style of movement. In the world of sea stars, this is a bit like a gallop. Now, relatives of the sea stars, the brittle stars, felt like this way of walking didn't quite have enough pep. Instead of using tubed feet to move, brittle stars use their arms in a sort of breaststroke with a leading handshake. And they're good at it too. When they get going, they're pretty quick. To change direction, they don't turn, they just lead with a different arm. I mean, they're not facing in any particular direction because they don't have a face. And that's what happens when you forget to evolve a head. And they can be quite cute, especially when they're little. Look at this one, he's adorable. But look at this right here. I know what you're thinking. Why does that fish look so freaked out? It's just a harmless little brittle star. Well, that's what Marjorie the Squid thought too. She was out there minding her own business, got a little distracted and wound up in the wrong neighborhood. And look, a brittle star just reaches up and grabs her. She gets away from that one, but the problem is she's surrounded. They're freaking everywhere. Bad day for Marjorie. That's what you get if you don't pay attention. Don't worry, she gets away. Just kidding. She dies. I'm telling you, brittle stars are quite aggressive. One finds a dead fish and suddenly it's a full-on rumble. Look, <laughs> that one's getting away. Run away! <laughs> I digress. 
Now, brittle stars do have tubed feet. They just don't use them for walking. Instead, it turns out that tubed feet can be used to do all sorts of things. For one, they can absorb oxygen and be used for breathing. Your foot can't do that. Your foot's boring. And it's not just breathing either. On the tips of their arms, sea stars have a cluster of thin, wispy, modified tubed feet. These seem to have chemoreceptive abilities that can sense concentrations of different molecules in the water around them. Now, they don't have a central brain butt, sorry, central brain, but instead they have a distributed nervous system. The arms and even individual parts of the arms can sense and react to stimuli on their own. Bigger decisions, like which way to move, are made by integrating signals across all of the arms. And it's not just touch and chemical signals. You see that little orange thing? You know what that is? It's a freaking eye. Each arm has a freaking eye on the end. How crazy is that? You can't tell them not to point and stare. That's just how the sea star do. If they ever evolve faces like a people, this is what you'd be looking at. This compound eye sits on, you'll never guess this, a modified tubed foot. Up close, you can see that it's a cluster of photoreceptive cells. See? Sea stars see. But they're not crazy good at the seeing thing. You know, you wouldn't want their help with a jigsaw puzzle, but it's probably good enough to help the sea star get its bearings. An eye on each arm means that sea stars can have a near 360 degree simultaneous field of vision. Can't sneak up on sea star. Sea stars sneak up on you. Some species have even fancier bits. The sea star Linkia levigata is an eye that is surrounded by darkened, really, again, all right, tube feet. I really feel like we could make a case for dropping the word feet. These darkened but see-through tubes seem to act like sunglasses. And look at that, they can close their eye all the way. They can friggin' wink. With the help of their sensory tubes and little eyes, sea stars can search around for things to eat. Different species are looking for different things. Preferably something they can catch, which does limit it a bit. Some of them just sort of sift through the bits that they find in the great litter box of the ocean floor. Mud stars full-on bury themselves and eat mouthfuls of it. Their mouth's already pointed that way and they don't have to move that far, so that's good. Downside is they're eating mud. Other species prefer coral, which sometimes comes on a stick. It's like if you found a shish kebab the size of a palm tree. Just climb on and start eating your way to the top. These sea stars don't really have teeth or the kind of mouth you can chew with. So instead, they evert their stomach, which is a fancy science word for saying turns the insides the outsy. The stomach then just starts digesting on the outside. Sucks for the coral, horrible way to die, and it can take months. If a sea star has a taste for a stupid clam, it can use its little suction cup feet to pry apart the shell wide enough so that it can stick its stomach in there and go to work. I know what you're thinking, my stomach can't do that. Well, not with that attitude. Deep sea sea stars in the order Brisingida have a different technique. They suspension feed, curling their arms up into the water column and trapping things that float by with the help of their pedicillary. Oh right, I still have to tell you about the pedicillary. As if they weren't crazy enough, sea stars are often covered in hundreds if not thousands of little pinchy pinchers. Sometimes they surround spines in clusters that can almost look like little pom-poms. Of death, up close you can see they're no joke, like little bear traps, and they actually work. They come in different shapes and sizes. Some look like little tweezers, others can almost look like clamshells. The thinking is that they're mainly used to stop parasites from getting too cozy on the surface of the sea star. However, some species figured out how to use them to catch prey, in some cases even small fish. Now the sea urchins went next level with all this. They have three-sided pedicillary that are often on the end of long stalks. Up close they can sometimes look like forceps. In the flower sea urchin these little jaws are covered in a membrane, which when open make them look like tiny round flowers. But when they're disturbed they snap shut into a little star shape and deliver a toxin. It's crazy, right? It just gets weirder and weirder. They're probably gonna evolve to shoot them out like little drones. Well, that already happened. When the collector urchin senses a predator is about, it ejects a whole bunch of its pedicillary into the water, and they just float around chomping and injecting venom into anything they touch. It's like a little cloud of pain. Anyway, while Brisingids use pedicillary to suspension feed, another relative of sea stars, the crinoids, figured out a different way to do it. Their arms have evolved into what basically can look like feathers. These arms are lined with tubed feet and mucus-covered cilia. Little particles get trapped and then move to the center of the arms, where tube feet sort of snot-roll them into little balls and transport them down towards the mouth. 
They just sort of sit there and let the food come to... Holy what? It turns out that even though they can look like clumps of starving agave, some feather star crinoids can get quite fidgety. Look at this one walking around on his fingertips. One group in the order Cometulida even figured out how to swim. Don't know who taught them. <laughs> Can't exactly throw them in the deep end, can you? <laughs> Dad joke. In any case, these feather star crinoids figured it out and they float or swim until they find a new place to grab on with those, well, the science hippies call them Siri. But come on, those are witch fingers. And if you know anything about witch fingers, you know how good they are at grabbing. Another group of crinoids, the sea lilies, decided to go more like full-on plant with roots and all. They have a long stalk that attaches quite firmly to the sea floor. This holdfast keeps them anchored and in place, even when they're pummeled by strong currents. And it looks like an idyllic life, doesn't it? Beachfront property, palm tree, well, I guess you are the palm trees, but overall a good setup to suspension feed in peace. If it weren't for these crazy things, these are sideroid sea urchins, and they look a bit like the ball they use in soccer for masochists. But the spiky bits aren't the problem, it's what's underneath. These sea urchins have a mouth that comes with five teeth-like things that can self-sharpen as they rub against each other. It's terrifying. This mouth part contraption is called Aristotle's Lantern, which explains why no one ever wanted to sleep over at old Aristotle's. Most regular urchins use this to scrape stuff like algae off rocks, but these sideroid urchins developed a taste for flesh. Crinoid flesh. So this right here is a straight-up scene from a crinoid horror film. It's, uh, well, the pacing is a bit slower than you might be used to. But let me tell you, if you speed things up a bit, you can see that an urchin can seriously mess up a crinoid. Look at that, he totally ripped it apart. So here's the crazy thing. Some of these sea lilies have evolved a daring escape plan. At the base of their stalk, there are segments that they can weaken using a special kind of connective tissue. Under threat, some sea lilies will fall down and break their stalks on purpose, and then freaking crawl away. Look at that. It runs away like a mop that finally had enough of your garbage. It's amazing. <laughs> and that's the problem with living in the ocean. There's lots of things that want to eat you down there. Look at this crab, treating that brittle star like it's a pull-apart dinner roll. And that's what happens when you have all those sticking out bits. It's dangerous. Now, if you aren't good at running away, which I think we've established is the case with sea stars, you need other ways to protect yourself. You can cover yourself with sharp spines like this one in the genus Zoroaster, or the goat of spines, the crown of thorns sea star, but there's always an animal that figures out how to get around things like that. This Pacific triton here doesn't care about your thorny thorns. Now the cushion star, Teraster tessellatus, got a little more creative. It evolved a way to create and expel toxic slime from a little hole on the top of its body. Not a little bit of slime, either. Like, a lot of slime. But sea stars have a legit magic trick. They have this special collagenous tissue throughout their body that they can harden or soften fairly quickly. So for example, they can crawl into a crack when they're sort of limp and then stiffen up so they're wedged in there and you can't pull them out. But they can also use this collagenous tissue in the way that that sea lily did. They can weaken segments in their arm so that an arm can be pulled off easily. A treat for the predator and the starfish doesn't die win-win. And it isn't just when they're attacked. If they have sea star wasting disease like these ones do, they will pull their own arm off in order to save the rest. You can see how the tissue immediately closes around the open wound that leads to the body cavity. The arms that are detached are still alive and will sometimes keep on searching for food and passing it back to a mouth that doesn't exist. Now, of course, the second part of this magic trick is that they can grow their arm back. They start by recreating the outer tip of the arm, the part that has the sensory bits, and then they start to fill in the middle. Here's how the trick works. Animals start out as little undifferentiated clumps of cells. These cells, stem cells, can become any sort of tissue, a belly button, an eye. But in humans, for example, once they become that thing, they can't go back to being undifferentiated. Your belly button cannot turn into an eye. Sea star cells that are one thing can go back and become something else. And that's how the sea star can regrow an entire arm using the cells from its body. What's even more amazing is that in some species, an arm that is broken off at the right segment can grow a whole rest of a starfish back. I know what you're thinking, that's a pretty easy way to reproduce. 
There are a few species of sea star, like this one, Alastocaster insignis, that make more of themselves simply by splitting in two. The tiny little sea star Parvalastra vivipara can also do it solo, but not by ripping itself apart. Instead, it is a hermaphrodite and fertilizes its own eggs inside of itself. The babies are cannibals and eat each other inside the parent's body as they grow, until the lucky ones burst out of holes on its parent's back sometimes killing them in the process. There's a baby photo for you. Leptosterius polaris, on the other hand, gets into a little pile. The males release their sperm and the females release their eggs, and when they're fertilized, the females curl up in a swirl and sit on their eggs like a beard might. But most species don't put in nearly that level of effort. Males and females just release their baby-making bits into the water, cross their little tube feet and hope for the best. If all goes well, the next generation of sea star babies will soon be born. And then get eaten by that second baby. Oh well. And that is how the sea star do.